I'm making my own way But I stumble and I fall through every day But I love my baby, love my baby now But I love my baby, I'm still learning how Welcome to Pathway of Success. My name is Dan Fox and I'm with Boulder Psychological Services. I want to thank the Boulder Valley School District for hosting us here today. We are uh, discussing the very important topic of helping depressed and suicidal youth. I would like to introduce our panel. Starting on my left, we have Kathy Valentine. She is one of the chairpersons of the Hope Coalition of Boulder County, whose mission is to educate the community on the topics of depression and suicide awareness. She is a retired school counselor and the executive director of Coley's Closet, a peer education organization. Thanks for joining us, Kathy. Next, we have Jasmine Lee. She is a senior at Fairview High School. She's involved in Coley's Closet and her school's Sources of Strength and Leadership Cabinet's Mental Health Committee. She is very open to talking about mental health as a youth and Asian American in talks and essays. Thanks for joining us, Jasmine. Kimberly Bryant is a relationship-focused family therapist and therapeutic consultant supporting families in the Boulder community. Kimberly works with treatment providers and programs locally and around the country to assist with individualized treatment needs for adolescents, young adults, and their families. We have Wendy Stern, who is the founder and president of the Grief Support Network, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to transform the way that individuals and our culture experience loss. She is a certified yoga therapist and offers a mindful approach to grieving through meditation, yoga, movement, personal growth work, and the art of listening as a pathway to healing and connection with self and community. Thanks for coming, Wendy. And finally, we have Philip Horner, who is a licensed clinical social worker and certified group therapist. He is the executive director, director of Whole Connection, a small group practice focused on serving the Medicaid population and offering low income therapy. Philip also runs groups focused on understanding patterns in our relationships and works with a wide variety of people individually, including those who have had abuse or neglect in their lives, those who are going through difficult transition periods, and people trying to repair their attachments. So, Thank you all on the panel for coming. I'm gonna dive right into our topic. This is um, something that we have a lot to talk about today. It's a very pertinent issue. There's been a lot of community interest in what we're going to be discussing. And I wanna dive right into a new finding, a study that um, came out from the Center for Disease Control last month showing that teenage suicide rates have increased nearly 56% from 2007 to 2017. They urged early intervention in the form of initiatives like suicide screening and exposure to positive stories about people recovering from feelings of suicidal ideation. So for the panelists, and remember to hit your button if you're gonna answer, when we hear this as parents, what should we be doing? You wanna start us off, Kathy? Most important, I would say, you take it seriously. Uh, many times we hear that parents, well, as parents, we can be very afraid of these any kind of behaviors that uh, scare us. And I think there are times when we can do a very good job of denying what's happening with our kid. And we can be thinking that it's just a teenage angst or it's something going on at school, and or that they're just doing this to get attention. And I can just say that for the Hope Coalition, our mantra and Coley's Closet as well is give them the attention. Make sure you take them seriously. Um, it's scary to hear these statistics, uh, and that's why we are doing as much as we can with the Hope Coalition anyway to educate the population, educate our community about warning signs, risk factors, what do you do, where are the resources, uh, just the same as Coley's Closet. We are, that's what the students do there. Thanks. I think what our kids want more than anything is to be heard. 
Um, so, so yes, taking them seriously and really listening, like like deep listening, like with our whole being, and um, and listening in a way where they won't feel judged. So unconditional love and acceptance of their experience and their feelings, um, I feel really opens the door for more communication and sharing, and for these things to be out in the open um, rather than it be something that they that they feel they have to hold in and hide. Um, so that we can be in connection with them, you know, with whatever it is they're going through. Um, the other thing you said, um, kind of in that question, is around hearing positive stories. And I think, you know, creating more opportunities for connection, for kids to come together and, and hear, number one, they're not alone, um, and, and to be able to relate to other people people going through it, other peers their age, um, and to give them tools on, on kind of how to access maybe some of the positive things happening, how to work with, you know, we work with affirmations um, sometimes in the program that I do with these kids called Mindful Connections, um, and, and we give them tools how to kind of, kind of tap into that place of resiliency. Thanks. Yeah. Kimberly. I think in terms of you know what should we be doing there's a there's a real need for there to be a conversation about prevention that's happening super early I think that work around educating parents on ways to communicate and ways to relate with their children early on so that those patterns of feeling safe and connected in their families and belonging with parents is really an initial foundational way that we can be preventing some of this as it starts to develop as kids are getting older. So again, early prevention and early education of parents of kind of how are we parenting in a way that helps our child feel really safe to talk to us, come to us, mm -hmm. so that we know what's going on in their worlds and we can be ahead of the game with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything that's being said. I think that one of the most difficult things is having that conversation. And sometimes, particularly if we have a good relationship with our family, the first time that a child might talk about suicide or feeling depressed might actually be in the home. And if it is, it's really important how we respond. And so in that instance, we have to be careful of how we react. We can easily shame or stigmatize these feelings, which is going to end that conversation. And so I think as it's brought up, we're hoping that we can keep the conversation going and helping them feel safe to be able to keep doing it. This is bringing up a, a question I had around how to talk to kids directly about feeling depressed or suicidal, and wondering if we introduce the topic, does that make them more likely to be considering it or attempting it? How do we, as parents, know whether it's okay to step in or not? Jasmine. Yeah, so this is actually one of the biggest misconceptions around suicide and depression that if just by asking someone if they are depressed or suicidal will make them more likely to consider it. But there have been lots of extensive research studies on a lot of peer-reviewed journals that show that, in fact, it can actually decrease this ideation in a lot of kids. And it's a really important part, I feel, just to even be brave enough to reach out to a kid or your own child if they are struggling just to be brave enough to really reach out to them and have a conversation and really just show them that you they are not alone and that you actually care about them despite whatever they might be going through. Thanks. Philip. Thank you for that research. It's nice to know sometimes the research backs up your own theories, so that feels good to hear. Um, I also agree. I think you should talk about it. Um, I believe a lot of times it's our fear to not talk about it because of how it brings up our own feelings and not about our children. And so the more we actually can discuss it, the more helpful most likely we're going to be able to find solutions and other resources. Um, and so creating space for that is really important. Kathy. I really am just going to reiterate what Jasmine said and all of everyone said that uh, it really has been researched that people who are have been asked about how they're doing and what's going on and being not being afraid to ask them if they are feeling like they might take their own life, might be suicidal, or 
how are they feeling? Do you have, do you think you might be depressed? Actually opens up the topic, actually opens them up to knowing just what Jasmine said, that someone's listening, somebody seems to notice them, even if it's kids talking to kids or me talking to my friend. I mean, it doesn't matter how old we are when we start asking those questions and letting people know that you're watching, you're, you're, you're attending to your kid, your parent, your sister, your best friend, it, it helps, I believe. Kimberly. And that you're willing to have the scary, hard conversation, that they're important enough to you, that you're willing to have that scary conversation. And I think this again just comes back to connection. You know, there's so much, so much, so many things that can make um, kids feel so isolated and alone. So us just paying attention and them knowing we're paying attention uh, bridges the gap. Jasmine. Yeah, just to reiterate, I feel like the hardest part is just having that conversation, and just by being willing to sh have that conversation shows that it's actually a normal thing to have, and it's not something that even if your parents are a trusted adult, that if you're willing to have that conversation, that you are not falling into that stigma and just showing that it is something that all of us may experience and it's something completely normal. Are there other things for parents to be paying attention to in terms of signs or symptoms other than that they might get a verbal kind of connection and communication with their kids? Because sometimes that connection is hard. Sometimes our kiddos aren't very good at expressing what's going on on the inside. What options do we have as parents at that point to be able to get a pulse on what's going on? Kimberly. So in our big busy lives where we have a million things going on all the time, are we as parents able to slow down and track what's going on with our kids? Are we noticing if they're isolating? Are we noticing if they're spending time with friends? Are we noticing if their grades are slipping? I think that those are some of the most important initial factors that we should be paying attention to. It's really what's going on. How are our kids doing? And if we're not aware of that or if our lives are so full that we can't track that, you know, we need to really adjust and make sure that we're able to be present and aware and relating with our kids so that we can know if something's off for them. Thanks. Jasmine. Yeah, so there are a lot of warning signs, and I think one of the biggest ones, especially in this age, is just social media, and there's a huge presence that if you see anything even concerning, then just reach out. And also a big thing is that death is, and suicide is something that kids often joke about today because if you have practice after school, you have a million tests or just all these different factors or stress at home, stress at jobs, like all these different stresses can really just make us kids that we also joke about, oh, I have three tests, I want to kill myself. And there's also this fine line between when we joke about it or when it's serious. And I think it's important whether if, if it is a joke or if it's serious that you always take a step to make sure that we're all okay and it doesn't really matter if it was a joke in the first place. It's just always better to be cautious and really take that step. Thanks. Kathy. Um, in addition to what Kimberly was saying also and Jasmine, in terms of warning signs, um, any kind of major changes in behavior is what we look for. And it, it, again, if your child was one who slept in till mid, you know, noon, except for going to school, and all of a sudden is up early, and I mean, that's good, right? But it's a major, major change. Uh, the other one might be eating. All of a sudden, they're not eating like they used to, or they're irritable. That's one thing, apparently, for middle school and high school, I mean, as they start maturing. Um, irritability, even though we do think sometimes, oh, that's just sort of teenage stuff, because they're so, you can talk more about teenage stuff than I can. I don't remember too much of it. But um, that is a big thing. Any kind of behavioral changes, personality changes, are, are really, instead of saying, oh, that's just 
middle school stuff, you know, or that's just what happens. I remember when I was a teenager, I was, you know, changes. Keep them in mind and, and begin to talk about them. We're going to shift our questions now into what kind of ways we can support and intervene now that we've recognized, all right, there's a situation that we want to be helpful with and as supportive as possible. So first, what are things that are important to communicate to someone who we know is depressed and suicidal and we have a connection with? Jasmine. I think one of the biggest things is just being there to listen and not telling them what to do or what to feel or just be happy or look at all the things that you have rather than just being there that you might not know what they might be feeling saying that I might not completely understand what you're feeling but I'm here to listen for you, listen to you I'm here to care for you and I care about you and just being there not just being there to listen to them and being open to that conversation and actually we've as Chloe's closet we've actually been giving out these adult handbooks from this organization called Robbie's Hope, which is actually in Colorado. And it's just a handbook written by a bunch of teenagers on how adults should actually start this conversation. And they reiterate a lot of just listening and it might not be easy and it might require persistence, but this is a really great resource that we've been given to teachers uh, at the different schools that we present to. So I think this is a great resource for adults. Thank you. Philip. First, I want to thank you both because I'm thinking of preventative things and you're talking about things that make sure that maybe people like ourselves don't, aren't the people that have to come to, that you're getting uh, the parents already educated and helping them address problems before they get worse. So thank you. I'm hearing that a lot. And I'm, I, when I jotted down some of the things here, I underlined listen like three times. Um, and really when you're listening, what's really important here is that you're not trying to fix the problem. You're just hearing what's happening. Sometimes you're literally saying exactly what they're saying back to them so they know you hear them. And in different, uh, depending on what the culture of your family is or your identity, physical support. It's sometimes just having a hug actually can do a lot because it can bring up things that words won't be able to. Thanks. Wendy. Um, I'm also going to reiterate so much of what's been spoken because I also believe that listening is really the key. Um, and listening, like you said, without um, needing to solve the problem. And I think that's harder with our kids than anywhere else, actually. I know with a client, I can offer that reflective space. And, and, and with my own kid, it, it's almost more difficult to actually get out of the way and put my own opinions or assumptions aside. But what I find is that when I do, that it, it opens the door for more sharing and more connection. Um, and, and it also allows her to find her own answers, to find, allows our kids to find their own answers rather than imposing um, what we think the solution should be. So I love that, you know, that teens, that you guys are taking upon yourselves to, to, to tell adults like what you need, like how do we, how to communicate in a way that is most supportive. Um, I also think it's amazing how um, teens are doing this for each other, you know, listening and holding space for each other and holding these safe spaces where you won't be judged, where you won't be criticized, um, which allows for a deepening of, of sharing and connection. So, um, yeah, I'm on board. So as a parent, there would be two things that I think I would be wanting to say and not sure if I should be saying, and one would be, don't do this, your whole family, like we would all be devastated, like this is, you matter, this is gonna really, like your sister would be so upset, those kinds of things, which, I, is that too much of a burden to put on our kiddos? And at the same time, the other thing of saying, like I, I really hear what you said, Jasmine, about not sort of like telling people what to do or how to feel and listening, but can we say, oh, like, this will be like, this is going to pass tomorrow. It's going to be back on track. You haven't like screwed up your whole life. Like everything isn't ruined. It'll be okay. Are we allowed to kind of cheerlead and encourage like that? Philip. So this kind of goes to the point I wanted to name a little more about the listening, because I think it's easy for us to try and want to take care of ourselves. And I think that's what some of those questions are saying is trying to do whatever we can to make sure we think 
that they will be okay so that we can feel okay later too. Um, and I think what some of those things we're trying to say there are also we're trying to figure out a way for everything to be better and fine. And that comes back to kind of the problem solving in some ways. And, and I'm not saying that you can't say those things because in some ways some of the work we do when we make plans and try and help people find uh, things to think about is we do think about out loud. What are reasons we are wanting to be around and what things do we like? But at that moment, I think when they're talking to their parents, that might not be the time. And I think actually by listening, you that is part of the solution right there. That sometimes when we start to listen, we're thinking, oh, well, I listen, I do that, I listen, but that's not solving anything. That is a step in the problem solving. You need to do that first before you can do anything else. And it's very much part of the solution. So if you're out there thinking, well, I want to have a solution to this, this is part of it. Thank you. Jasmine. I definitely agree with just how at that moment, listening is one of the biggest solutions, even when you're having that conversation, because at that point, maybe their life is just currently so hard that they want to end their pain at that moment. So saying that it will get better, it's sometimes too hard to even imagine a future or a different life. And they do want to keep living, and they just want someone to listen and just offer some support in that specific moment that you're having that conversation. Wendy. I want to um, kind of add on to that and, and also just speak to the power of being witnessed, whether it be in a group or just one-on-one -on -one with our kids. You know, when, when, we're, when we're not just listening but witnessing them, speaking about something that's, that's very real for them and, and very personal, um, we also are offering them a reflection and helping them to see and hear themselves better too. So there's a reflection piece that we can offer in just our presence and being open and, and really right there with them that not only do they know we care and we're here and we're with them, but also we're also being a bit of a mirror for them if we can kind of not give advice and some of these other things and stay out of the way so that they can also clarify what they feel. And what and what they may what may be happening inside. So I think that witness piece is important as well. Kathy, I'm just going to jump to a resource. I mean, we have many resources in our community. I just want to point out that the Parent Engagement Network. I don't know many of you know. Puts on they, there are um, multitude of speakers and workshops, etc. That they do in the schools um, through the community on just this topic: how to speak, how to talk with your child, and part, most of it has to do with getting out of the way. But how do you do that and empowering parents to know that how, a little bit more about how to do this and know that they're okay, they're not doing it wrong they're just this is some support to help us as in our parenting so let's expand beyond just as a parent what I can do in relationship to what other resources or interventions should I be considering if I'm worried about my kiddo and that they're not getting enough support for whatever is causing the depression or suicidal feelings Um, I think this has been brought up a couple times, but this is a good place to say it again, is peer groups. Um, finding, there's, there's lots of peer groups in schools, um, outside, therapists run them, mentors run them, uh, teachers run them, students run them, um, to support these conversations so that people don't feel alone and they know that this is something that happens to a lot of people. Um, so I, I would really press that. Um, and another one that might seem obvious, but you also have to be very careful with of how it's presented is counseling. Counseling can be a very powerful thing and the therapy has been shown to help, but it also can be pushed in such a way that it, it looks negative to people. And so we can create a stigma around it. So in some ways it has, there has to be some joint motivation by the child to wanting to do that. Thanks. Wendy? Um, yeah, I think creating connection. I mean, this has been kind of my theme throughout, I guess, but, um, but helping kids know that they're not alone and giving them a safe space where they can talk, where they can show up however they are and not be judged. 
Um, and, and recently, the Grief Support Network has um, started piloting a new program I mentioned earlier called Mindful Connections. And this is to do exactly this. It's, it's peer support. It's bringing a group of kids together. And it's giving them, first and foremost, that place to talk about what they're feeling. But it also gives them tools to move through some of the more challenging things they feel inside. And some of the tools we use are meditation and movement or yoga and journaling and different ways that they can learn how to um, not just notice what they're feeling, but to, to understand where that is living in their own bodies and to be able to orient to themselves and to be able to even just find that place within themselves where they can feel connection. Um, and to also have the support of a group to be that witness presence for them, to help them um, see and know themselves better, and to also know they're not alone. So as each, each um, person shares, they hear the other person's stories and things they may be thinking and feeling and feeling completely alone in that, all of a sudden there's connection. And then they know they're not the only one feeling that. So it's, it's a program that's still new and we're still piloting it, um, but we're really excited about bringing this to the district and opening just more opportunities for kids to come together and support each other. Thanks. Kimberly. I think when we're trying to do preventative measures, and I think especially when <clears throat> you know kids are really kind of starting to have these thoughts and these feelings, you know, all of our initiatives and uh, and, sit, and I'm sorry, my words are slipping out of my mouth. All of our initiatives and all the ways in which we as a community can support kiddos in, in having a safe place to talk, having groups and community where they can come and feel seen and known and heard and hear others and know that they're not alone. Those things are really, really critical. Um, there is then kind of that crossover point when we are starting to really be concerned because we have kids that are not safe anymore. When we missed them. We didn't create the community and the safety and the sense of feeling seen and known and heard that allowed them to be able to get support. And now we have a situation where we have a kiddo who really is determined to harm themselves. And, and at that point, the resources that we need to look at shift. What we see and you know, within a mental health system that's a bit broken is that oftentimes those kiddos kind of end up in a traumatic experience on top of their feelings of being suicidal or any attempts at suicide, that now they're kind of shoved into this system where they're you know, in hospitals and in places where they might get locked up for a couple of days and you know, things are, that can create a whole nother layer of trauma and fear and <clears throat> I say broken because my experience is that that pattern of how we attend to children that are, are harm and a threat to themselves is not super functional in actually resolving the issue. It does throw up a big red flag and then we have a responsibility to figure out what are we going to do next. Um, and, and our job then becomes how do we keep this kiddo safe while we really do start to address the issues that have built to this point. And so, you know, that's where working with counselors, working with coaches as parents, working with family therapists really becomes critical. Working with our schools and the school counseling systems so that the school knows when our children are struggling, so that there's a lot of eyes on and a lot of support wrapping around. And sometimes that even means that we have to have a bigger conversation about more intensive, more stabilization support for kiddos to keep them safe. Um, so there's, there's, there's various steps of intervention that we can talk about and look at, but I, I think it's important to know that oftentimes if we're at the point where we have a kiddo who's harming themselves, that we've missed them. And I think for this conversation, that's what's important, is how do we make sure we're not missing anybody? What do we need to keep doing as a community to make sure that we're, we're integrating these conversations into our children's lives early enough that we're not, we're not having to work hard to keep them alive because things have gotten so difficult for them? Thank you. Jasmine. Uh, yeah, I think one of the biggest things is if you are concerned that you do reach out to a trusted adult in their life that may not be 
yourself because referring to how you said that you sometimes find it difficult to even talk with your own child and sometimes you're so emotionally invested already that you can't really see the possible resources. So I think a big thing is just reaching out to a counselor or a therapist or with Second Wind Fund you get, it provides free therapy with that youth that need free therapy. And also if you're unable to pay for therapy, I feel like parents should be willing to treat mental health the same way as physical health. If your child is having a broken leg, you're going to seek out doctors and keep seeking out until your child has fixed that broken leg. And similarly, I feel parents should, or any adult in general, should treat mental health the same way, just getting, seeking therapists and seeking help for their child in any situation like that. I want to go into some questions that bring up some of these scenarios sort of in the trenches. First, um, my teenager is using marijuana daily and says it keeps him from feeling suicidal. I think it is isolating him and making him more depressed. What should I do? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I'll jump Bill. in. Sure. Um, th this is a tough one. I, I think that um, it, you know, both these things can happen. You can feel uh, more isolated and more depressed from it, and there's not enough research yet done on marijuana to truly understand all of the impacts of it. Um, saying that, a lot of this is education for ourselves and particularly for our children so they understand the possibilities of what can happen. Um, there is still very limited research on the findings of how it impacts people, just like, and we're probably going to talk about this later too, uh, psychiatric medications. There's a possibility for help too, and um, we don't always know how it works or interacts. And I know you know this really well, Dan, and about the brain and how it works, and um, that it, this is something to discuss, it's something to educate, it's something to learn a lot about. Um, but just like when we're having conversations about suicide or depression, we have to be really careful how we have them um, with our kids. Because if we have them in such a way that we're condemning something and we're uh, putting it down in such a way, then they probably won't have that conversation anymore with us. And they'll probably do that behind our backs. Um, so it's really important that we can still have the conversation and continue having it so that they can also learn while we learn about the new studies and everything coming out about this. Thanks. Kimberly. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, addressing a situation like this really is twofold because what we do know from the research that's coming out is that regular drug use of any kind is compromising dopamine functioning and creates feelings of anxiety and depression. And so in some ways, just the substance use in and of itself is, could be part of what's creating the problem for a kiddo like this. Um, and coming in and saying, well, you should just stop smoking pot because that's causing this for you, right, isn't going to be the answer, right? So there's a, there's a need to honor the intelligence and wisdom in our children by educating them, helping them know what's happening physiologically as a result of substance use, which I think as, as a community is a big conversation that we need to continue to have. How are we making sure we're educating kids about this? There's initiatives in our community such as Natural Highs that are getting out there and trying to make sure that kids are understanding these, these, this information and this new research so that they can make informed decisions. But I think we have a long way to go to making sure that that information is streamlined for them. But I think also, if we as parents don't know whether or not our child is okay, we need to get help. We need to reach out. We need to, who at school is tracking my kid? What are they seeing? Who are the, you know, who's a counselor in town who we can talk to so that whether our child's willing to go or not, we go and we get educated and learn about how to take good care of our kiddos when we see that there's something concerning going on. Thanks. Wendy. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said around this so far, and, and I, I do think a big piece is to not shame them and, you know, with that, closing down the doors for communication. So keeping it open so they'll keep talking to us and educating them, and I think when we educate them, then we empower them to make 
like informed decisions, you know, for themselves with support, with guidance and oversight, but, you know, just to say, well, you can't do this or it's wrong, you know, isn't going to actually <laughs> fix, you know, calm our worry and, and, and fix the problem, but to educate them. And I know, you know, for me with, with my kiddo to help her like really understand what what the effects are and the possibilities are and what that could do um, will help her to make the right choices along the way. Not that she always will, but 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 will at least put them on that path. Um, and I think what you said about like at a certain point, like reaching out to the people in your child's network is really important too. Because as parents, we can't see everything all the time. It's so easy to have a to have a miss or just to not know. So to get other heads in it, to really talk to our kids' teachers and the people in their lives to understand a fuller picture of what's happening, I think is really important as well. Thanks, Jasmine. I think this could also be just a way of a coping mechanism and it could be really unhealthy, just tying back into the education part, but I also think it could be helpful just to provide as part of sources of strength, refer to all these different sources of strength, like family or family of choice or friends or healthy activities, just being active and just a huge part is just with taking away that technology and just really being able to feel things and just be able to, all these different sources of strength, uh, I think could be helpful as a different alternative to coping. Thanks. Kathy. I'd just like to back up just a little bit to what Jasmine said about the diagnosing of, you know, if your, your child or anybody is saying, I, I'm depressed and this is why I'm doing drugs. Um, I guess I, I just thought of this, but perhaps we should just see if this is really true that you are depressed and move back to that as opposed to jumping on the drugs, which, and say, you know, if, if you had a sore throat, I, I would want you to go to the doctor to make sure that you don't have strep or whatever, or you're not getting pneumonia. It's the very same thing here, son. Um, I just want to make, I think I want to make sure, and you need to make sure if, so you know how to take care of yourself. If this truly is depression, is it anxiety? And, and because there are a number of, um, we call them categories, types of depression, maybe we should at least find out if that is, if it is depression, is it anxiety? Is it, you know, let's just, will you go with me so you can find out from the doctor or wherever we decide to go? That's just a suggestion. So that then the education of how to take care of yourself can come and whether or not marijuana or whatever else you're doing is, is really helping what we've just found out you have. Thanks. Another question. The school has called with concerns about my ninth grade daughter seeming very depressed. They recommended therapy, but she says there is nothing wrong and she doesn't need it. Should I be worried? Should I force her into therapy? Kimberly. I decided some years ago that I was no longer going to work with teenagers whose parents were making them come see me. And I think it was one of the best decisions I ever made because <clears throat> I think that it was exhausting, it was stressful, it was difficult for those kids and for myself to try to have therapy when they didn't want to be there. So I'm not any longer one who would encourage you to force your child to therapy. Maybe I never was, but I think just being a therapist working with adolescents, I've learned that that's an ineffective way to engage children in what's going on with them. So that's my first thought about this question. Nope, don't force her into therapy. I do think that parents educating themselves can sometimes take the place of what might happen if kids were in their own therapy, if parents are getting educated and getting support and working with family therapists or reading books or really making sure that they're getting resourced around how do I work with my daughter who's cutting? What is this cutting stuff? What's going on with it? What do I need to do about it? Um, and I think most importantly, you know, as we all keep kind of referencing back to is what's in the way of being able to talk to your daughter about what's going on with her and why is she cutting and what's happening in her heart and mind and body and being that's driving her to these patterns of, of 
behavior and and if you're not able to have those conversations, get some help for learning how to have those conversations and create a dynamic with your daughter that makes it safe to have those, those conversations. Thanks. Wendy. I, I agree with everything you just said, and I think that parents have such an important role in this. And I think that if we, if we were to force that to happen, first of all, if there's not a willingness for them to be there, like you said, I, I see the kids in groups and they're not going to participate. And, and they're not going to get much out of it. And I think there can be a stigma around it that something is wrong with you um, and that that can close the doors as well. But as a parent, if you're educated in yourself and knowing how to sit and be with them and talk to them and support them, um, there's just such a beautiful opportunity in that for a deepening of the relationship as well as really making sure they stay safe. Thanks. Philip. Yeah, I like what you're both saying, and I, I look at this as the same way in therapy. When we work with someone that has any kind of resistance to something, we're not going to keep pressing it. So if we keep pressing it, that resistance grows, it becomes even a harder subject to talk about, even if it's something we think at some point we need to talk about. Um, so I think it is the same as if we press someone to continue doing, to push, to talk about something, that they're telling you, I mean, what does it say, doesn't need then you're just building up the resistance that even if you get them into therapy, you've now given the therapist the hardest job. Probably impossible to deal with. Um, and not that a therapist can't do it, but it's a very small chance that a lot's gonna happen there. So I do believe being able to have that conversation and uh, mentioning it is, is fine, but forcing it's a different story. Uh, you're planting a seed when you talk about it and not putting it in such a way of saying that you know, this is available if you would like it, I'll support it. That's really nice. Some, a lot of kids I've seen take that up. I work with many that have taken that option and been like, you know, you mentioned this, would you still be willing to do that? And that means it's there. You're allowing it to be, but you're not pressing in such a way. I think something that we miss sometimes, though, here is community is a really strong supporter in a lot of ways for a lot of us, and trying to help find ways for that to exist, not just pressing therapy is really important. Thanks. Jasmine. I feel as if asking for help or even having a therapist is still something that's stigmatized and something that can be ashamed of for a child. So I don't think I agree with all of you saying that you shouldn't force your child to have therapy, but also just provide the resources there. And also educating yourself is just important to show that the child still has that choice for themselves and to eventually, at that moment, they may not be ready to reach out for help and take that step. So just being able to support them and care about them and just show that there are a lot of resources out there, I think is important at that point. Thanks. Final question. My high school senior. Oh, sure. Kimberly, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to break back in. I think there was one piece about that question that I want to make sure we don't overlook for parents who are listening to this right now who have teenagers who are cutting and really trying to make sense of what is that and what's going on with that. I think, you know, we can overlook it quickly in this conversation because we're talking perhaps about <clears throat> maybe, you know, a bigger issue of, of life and death. But, I, you know, for parents to know that when you have a child that's cutting, it's it's definitely a sign that something needs to be addressed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your child is suicidal and that you know, you're know you in a crisis zone. So again, make sure you're getting support, you're getting educated so you understand that. Sometimes cutting is you know, a contagion issue with adolescents of, of you know, learning how to handle hard emotions rather than it meaning that somebody's really wanting to take their life. So learn more. Thanks. The final... Um, question about a scenario is my high school senior has gotten steadily more isolated and depressed and is now skipping classes. They have never felt comfortable identifying with a particular gender and this journey seems to be weighing heavily right now. What should I do? Jasmine. Yeah, so actually my sister is trans and this is something that has been a part of my life and I understand completely and I think one of the biggest thing as parents is not only just acknowledge them as but also be accepting and one of the biggest things especially just being Asian American and in this kind of new 
era, I guess, that a lot of parents may not be able to relate to is just being able to show not, not being judgmental because one of the biggest fears is that backlash and that's really what causes this isolation from society or people or friends or family. And I think the biggest thing is being accepting and showing that they will love them and that you will love them and care about them whether they identify as one gender or another. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I believe that this is really important and it goes along with some of the things we've already said is creating a space where you can listen and know you don't understand this and that this might be a lot different than your own process and experience um, and accepting that and allowing your kids to understand that, that you're here to listen and that you don't expect to know exactly what's happening, but that you're being their support and, and saying that if they're open, there's lots of supports in the community. In schools, uh, there's organizations just devoted to trying to help children, particularly if um, they're trying to figure out their own identity. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues in that, but first and foremost is not creating more of a judgment or stigma around this. Thanks. I have uh, two final questions that I wanna fit in. They're not necessarily, you know, time to be at the end, but they're just important parts of our conversation. Um, the first one, is medication necessary? If medication is started, will they be able to get off it at a point later on? Phil. Um, I think this is a great question, and I have a lot of thoughts about it, so I'll try and keep myself short. Um, but I, uh, I think this also can be a controversial question. I think a lot of people are going to have strong opinions about this. I don't think medication has to be necessary. I believe it is an option for people and it is there and can be useful. Um, and that if some people are suffering from certain things, it can be really an amazing thing. And there can be really hard side effects because of it. And we have to be realistic about that and be very educated about what medication can look like. Um, saying that, you can get off medication later. It is not a lifetime sentence if you decide to use medication or go that route. Um, but I also encourage that this is also a very stigmatized thing, that kids probably know that ahead of time. Um, they're going to feel certain things. They're going to feel res uh, a certain response if that's brought up. Um, so it's a very delicate thing to approach. Um, so I'd be careful how this subject is brought up. Sometimes kids want medication, right? Sometimes kids are really desperate and wanting to feel better, and so they come to parents saying, please, can I? Will you get this for me? So I think really working with professionals who can suss out what's most appropriate and what's gonna be most helpful, and like Philip said, really making sure you understand side effects and long-term kind of outcomes and functioning of getting on any kind of psychotropic medication for, mood or emotional support is going to be really important. We have some great people in Boulder. Sometimes it can be hard to get in to see them. But um, yeah, make sure you have a lot of support around those conversations. Thanks. Kathy. Importantly, I, I've always been told, and I, I know it's true, that if you're doing, if you're going to be taking medication for depression or anxiety, be sure to do talk therapy at, at the same time. Um, both need to be happening. But we've also um, just recently had a, a speaker at Coley's Closet who was talking about nutrition and how a very important lifestyle changes can also, can also, with people helping you know what's best for you individually, can certainly make some differences as well with the fact that a lot of, uh, we just learned, did we not, that serotonin uh, is mostly in our gut as opposed into our brain. So what do we do in our eating and how to make sure that we fortify ourselves to help with our emotional self as well as our uh, physical self. So there are more and more op options presenting themselves as, as I'm learning. Thank you. Wendy. Um, I, I think of it from that perspective as well, like really a, a very holistic 
lifestyle perspective. And, you know, my expertise is actually not in whether or not medication is appropriate or not, but what I, what I um, am an expert in is, like, looking at what's beneath that. Um, so in the area of grief and loss, which we haven't really touched upon, but there's so much that's often beneath it that it, whether our kids are asking for it, whether we're just seeing these behaviors or struggles and we want them to feel better, if we don't look at what is beneath that, then there can be a big miss opportunity for some real healing to happen of whatever they're holding inside that is causing these struggles. And what I do know about medication is that sometimes it can be a support in the right way, combined with talk therapy, that can kind of help them stabilize or kind of bring the threshold down so that they can deal with the issues that are causing those feelings in the first place. So for me, it's not a matter of like yes or no. It's more about how it's used. And also, are we really helping them address the, the issues, the pain, the struggle, whatever it is that's beneath it? Final question, what options or resources are there for parents who are worried that their child is in immediate danger? Jasmine. Well, in any emergency situation, definitely call 911 and you can also text 911. And a lot of resources that we previously mentioned are great for any non-emergency situation, but I think in any emergency, immediate danger is definitely just to immediately take action. Cool. Jump it in. Um, there's all, also the Colorado Crisis Line, um, which might uh, be maybe a step before. If you know something's about to happen in that moment, then 911, I agree. Um, but if there is thoughts and thinking, um, there are people on the phone ready to talk to you that can help a lot. And they might be the ones that help get to a hospital if need be or help calm the situation down. Um, I have the number written down just in case for people if they want it. It's easy to look online too. Oh, you have it right there? I have it right here. Um, I have 844-493-8255. All right, great. Just so everybody has it. Kimberly. I'll put a plug in for the Mental Health Partners Crisis Center as well. It's here in Boulder. They do a beautiful job of getting people in and spending the time needed to really do thorough assessment and figure out what's the most appropriate best step in an emergency. Thanks. Kathy. And I, again, I want to talk, I just want to put a plug in for the Second Wind Fund of Boulder County or Second Wind Fund, which is statewide, and it's uh, free and very much immediate therapy for youth 19 and under who, who do not have the resources, financial or, or um, insurance, for to take care of them. And they're, they need to be moving into the suicidal, severely depressed suicidal situation, but that's there, and it's easy to access, especially when they're in high school or middle school or even elementary, unfortunately, through the staff there, counselors, interventionists, et cetera, know how to access Second Wind Fund. That's a wonderful resource in our state. Thank you. Philip. Something I forgot to mention is if they're in immediate danger, stay with them. Yes. Don't leave. Uh, be with them on the phone when they're talking to someone. Be with them if you're taking them to the hospital. Be with them if they're with the police. Wherever uh, they go, you're going to go with them to offer that support. Um, don't let them be alone. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists for spending the time and sharing your expertise to make this very important uh, engagement happen. And I also want to thank our sponsors who have supported the Boulder Valley School District and Boulder Psychological Services for this event. They are the Boulder Public Library, the Mamie Dowd Eisenhower Public Library, the Parent Engagement Network, Centennial Peaks Hospital, the Hope Coalition, the Louisville Public Library, the Healthy Youth Alliance, Expand Mentoring, the Daily Camera, and Horizons K-8 School. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope very much this is helpful for you and your family. I'm making my own way But I stumble and I fall through every day But I love my baby, love my baby now But I love my baby, I'm still learning how Hey, hey, hey Hey, hey I'm okay Stay Can't you 
see and wait a while winter time.